Hi, this is Deanna. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. Today I am doing a short video answering the question for very beginners, what is rug hooking? Is rug hooking making a rug? Technically, I suppose it is, but most rug hookers I can tell you, including myself, rarely make a rug for the floor. I make rugs to go on walls. I've got some old rugs behind me. Uh, that I've got up on the walls as de a decoration. You can certainly make a rug for your floor if you want to. That's a bigger project. Even a welcome mat is a fairly big rug. Um, it's something that you can do if you like, but since the beginning of rug hooking, starting in the 19th century, um, people have been making rugs and not putting them on the floor, putting them on the wall. So then we're talking about a different kind of wall art. We're talking about being a craftsperson and an artist. You're making something for decoration. You're making something for the wall. You don't have to be making a floor rug. Uh, people have been doing this since some of the fine artists like um, Blanche Lizelle and Marguerite Zorick and um, even Alexander Calder made rugs intended for the walls. So it's kind of misleading when we say we are rug hookers. You get the impression that all of us are these weird Stephen King people constantly hiding inside our house with layers and layers of rugs all over the place. And it's just not the case. It's making art for the walls, just like you would if you did macrame or you did weaving or you did cross stitch or needlepoint, you would make things with fiber that you then hung up as a piece of art. So you're not a painter, you're painting with wool strips and yarn. So the kinds of things you can do with rug hooking, and I'm only talking about rug hooking in this video. I have other videos about other things. I have other videos about punch needle and Russian punch needle, the smaller version of it. But this video is just about uh, rug hooking. So I've got some older rugs like this. This is an old pattern by the Heritage Company. Um, this I think was called Jigsaw. There's ones like this that are called Broken Glass that are from Cushing Company. You can still get those patterns. Uh, something like this, another nice old rug that's hooked in a much smaller strip. If you can tell by looking at it, the strips that are, it's hooked with are pretty small. You see the loops on top, pretty small. The back looks like this, a little bit more unfinished. Hey, some people prefer the back to the front. The back of this one, this is a much older one. Uh, this is a much wider strip. This is more like a number seven or a number eight. The higher up the number of your strip goes, this is something you'll learn as you go along, uh, the wider your strip. And the wider your strip, the faster you finish your piece of work, but the less detail you get. So as you go along, you need to decide what's most important to you. I have smaller pieces too, like this little one I did for the Thanksgiving month. I did a November kit. This is all rug hooked with a rug hook in yarn. So this is done in yarn. If you think about the Claire Murray rugs, if you're familiar with those, those are all hooked in yarn. She did not use wool strips. There's two different things you can use to hook. This one I started and I haven't gotten back to a good old Lizzie Borden rug. And I hooked this, not with yarn, with strips, with wool strips. So let me show you what this actually means to rug hook. I'm gonna use a teaching frame, a, a small frame, not like the frame you would have. You would have a frame with backing over it. Your backing would be monk's cloth or linen or rug warp. Um, people don't typically use burlap anymore because we know that it rots quite easily, even on its own without hitting water, it rots, gets brittle. Uh, and your piece won't last quite as long. These are rug hooks. There's different kinds of rug hooks. Believe me, there are people who will sell you every size of, of rug hook under the sun. Uh, there are <coughs> sort of pencil style rug hooks. This one's real fine. There are bigger ones like this one <coughs> with a bigger head. So <coughs> don't feel like you have to buy 20 rug hooks. Feel like you have to buy one rug hook. And as you go along, when you're not joking, as you go along, you can figure out, yeah, maybe my, maybe things are not working great for me. My prop might be my hook. I started with a hook like this. This is a larger hook. This is called, let me bring you into focus. This is called sometimes a coarse or primitive or large hook. Hook sizes are not standardized, so it's very confusing to buy them. You don't want to accidentally buy something that's as fine as this. It's really, really small. The only time I use a fine hook like this is if I'm using super, 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 super thin wool strips or super thin yarn. I've been hooking for quite a while and I've done a lot of pieces and I'll tell you 99.99% of the time I use the same hook. It's a primitive coarse hook. I usually hook between a number five and a number eight and I hook with yarn all the time. Hardly ever does the same hook, and this is not an expensive hook, leave my hand. This is like a $12 kind of a hook. 
So let me show you what this actually looks like. This is a teaching frame. You would have a frame that looked something like this. Uh, that is a bit of an investment. You can always write to me if you need ideas of uh, inexpensive places to get that. You don't have to get a super artsy one, but this one has mesh over it so you can see what I'm doing. Any kind of backing that you use is gonna be gridded, whether it is monk's cloth or linen or rug warp, you're gonna see some kind of grid, meaning you can see the weave to it. And you will see in between your cloth, whatever you choose, little holes. And those little holes are opportunities to stick your needle in and pull something up. <clears throat> you end up choosing your pattern or no pattern at all, just practicing on your backing. And then you end up choosing either wool that you love, that you found at a Goodwill store that you cut out of something and wash so you know it's nice and clean and there aren't like moth eggs in it. Or maybe you went to the yarn store because you're a knitter and you found something like a skein of yarn and you're gonna use that to hook. Whatever you choose, you can hook. I just did a video the other day. If you don't have a cutter and you're not investing in all the crazy stuff right out of the gate, you can cut your wool strips with scissors or you can cut them with scissors and then rip them straight down the uh, sort of bias, the, if you're a weaver, the warp or the weft, one way or the other, just not diagonal. So there's lots of things you can do to get a beginning strip in your hand. This is a beginning strip number eight. This is called a primitive. This is pretty much the widest that people will cut. Um, you can rip your own that are even wider. This is much smaller. This is like a number five. These are my two favorites for thick and thin, a number five and a number eight. And then you have other choices. This is something from a recycled piece of clothing I got at Goodwill. So the, the hooking itself works like this. If you watch my hand, I'm gonna come right to you. I am holding the piece of cloth in my hand. I'm reaching down with my hook. My hook, you see the little grabby part here, the crook in the hook. It's reaching down through a hole. My hand underneath is wrapping around and this is pulling up to the surface. And I made a little loop. And I can pull it down if I want it a little bit lower. Routinely, you leave your tails up when you start so that this hand doesn't accidentally find a tail and rip it out and rip out a whole bunch of your work, right? If you're a knitter, you know that, you know that game too. And then you go into the next hole or the next obvious space and you pull another loop up. And then you wrap again, you pull another loop up and you go in whatever direction you want and you just keep reaching down with the hook and pulling up a loop. You try to make it pretty even. If it's not even, that's called artistic. You do it how you like it. You make sure that the way it's coming up is the way you like it. It's a rule of thumb if you want to be absolutely perfect and I'm not sure that you should even attempt that because life is not fun when you're so perfect. Um, you don't want this to look like a rug from home goods. You want it to look like, you know, a rug that you made. So don't be too obsessive about perfection, you know, when you're a beginner. But the rule of thumb is to make your loop as high up, lofty, as your strip is wide. So for me, that's working well. This is a little bit of recycled wool. This is my number eight strip that I cut with my cutter. And again, I have videos on different kinds of cutters. You can think about that later. It's gonna work the same way. You're reaching down, wrapping underneath, and you're pulling up a little loop. And you don't necessarily, particularly with the wider ones, have to go into every single loop. You'll see if it's getting too, what's called packed. It's getting too stuffy and close together. You'll notice that. You have to trust yourself that you'll notice that. And if you go too far away in what you do, you're gonna notice that there's a big gap. That's called a holiday in rug hooking. You're gonna notice that that's there. You have to trust yourself that you're gonna notice. Now, this is a number five strip, even smaller, right? This is one I cut on my machine too, but again, you could cut with a rotary cutter if you have it, and like a quilter's ruler. You could cut with any of the various cutters that are out there, but I cannot recommend spending hundreds or thousands of dollars on a cutter until you know that you like rug hooking, right? So it seems like, how is that possible that her hand is just wrapping each one and coming up so quickly each time. It's because I've been doing it for a little while. And when you do something for a little while, you know that there's a learning curve. You learn, your hand learns, it's, your hand has its own memory. The hand underneath won't be going through mesh that you can see through, it'll be going underneath some opaque fabric. So you won't be able to see what the hand is doing, but you have to trust yourself that sooner rather than later, that motion of wrapping the strip around to be pulled back up it will come to you. 
do not worry about what way you're holding the hook. If you're holding it this way or this way, do not worry and do not let people plant those kinds of seeds in your head. There are tons of teachers out there will, that will say, this is the wrong way, this is the wrong way. You hold it the way that helps you pull loops up and keep reminding yourself that once you pull that first loop up, you are rug hooking. This is one of those crafts where there is one thing to do and that is pull loops up. Once you do that first loop, everything that you do after that is just a question of you comparing yourself to yourself. Not a magazine, not another person, not your friend, not somebody in your guild or your group, just you comparing yourself to yourself. But you do that first loop and you have done it. It's just a question of improving on it expanding sort of creatively in whatever direction you see yourself going in the future and hopefully you don't see that yet because you want there to be some surprises around the around the river bend so in this case i was hooking uh, little bits of you know strips you can also hook anything things like this do you recognize this if you're like somebody who does needlepoint tapestry that kind of thing and you used to get tapestry kits or you found some of this at goodwill and you're thinking, what is that? Is that yarn? Well, it's 100% wool. You don't have to hook with 100% wool. If you're putting it on the floor, you probably do because you want the durability. But you know what? This is wool yarn. I could ply it. It's, it's three ply right now. Ply it means take it apart, the three plies. Now I've got two plies. Now I've got one ply. So you can ply it if you want. But if you like it this way, the thicker it is, the easier it's going to be to hook with. I'm doing the same thing. I'm putting down my hook. And I'm pulling up a loop and this time it's not wool it's wool but this time it's yarn so I'm hooking with yarn instead of hooking with strips and you know what it still works the same way and it works great can I mix these two things together of course you can you can mix anything together you can put you can hook a shoelace if you want to and mix that in too so that's hooking with wool I like to dye my own yarn too just for fun I usually use a two ply or a three ply um, this is a three ply, meaning how many strands it's got. It's just thick enough for me. I don't like to go too thick because my hand gets sore pulling loops up. So I like to go a little bit on the thinner side, but hooking with yarn, thick or thin, works great. Sometimes I hook with really thin yarn. If you know from knitting, like sock yarn, lace yarn, I hook with that too. I just double it up. Or sometimes I quadruple it up so that it goes faster. You know, you're just thinking along the lines of practicality and growing old, working on the same piece. This is a craft that can go quite fast. You can you can do this and you can do it quite fast and you can fool with your little loops later. You know, if you don't like them, you can fool with them. And if you really don't like them, this is what you do. And there's what, 10 seconds of work gone. You're not going to cry yourself to sleep over that. You're just going to say, I didn't like the way that looked. I didn't like that color next to that. I thought I'd like those two fibers next to each other. I was doing some crazy novelty eyelash stuff and I put it next to some wool strips and it just didn't look right to me, so I pulled it out. Hey, I lost five minutes of my life. I'm over it, it's okay. I put something else in that worked better. Um, but at the same time, make sure that you don't do too much of that. Sometimes you just cannot get a feel for what your finished piece looks like if you keep pulling it out. If you obsess too, too much, um, you can really slow yourself down and then you get it in your head. Oh, this craft takes forever. Who would ever want to do this? It takes forever to finish something. Just keep going for a little while and see how it goes. When you get to the end, it's just as easy at the end to pull out a few pieces and replace them with other pieces. It's not a big deal. This is a fun craft. All you need is a frame. You can get help with the frame and get suggestions in rug hooking groups. My rug hooking group is Facebook Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club. You can also always email me at ribboncandyhooking at gmail.com. I always send you links to frames, usually from Etsy, that are a good deal and a good beginner frame that you can get a lot of mileage out of. But for frames, you're looking at about $70 for a frame. And you're looking at about $12 for a hook. And then the only other thing is, do you have some leftover yarn? It can be acrylic yarn, or do you have some wool? Do you have something the moth got at? even a sweater. You can cut up sweaters with pairs of scissors and hook with those. But when you are pulling fabric up through your backing with a hook, no matter what style of hook it is, no matter what length of hook it is, no matter what size the crook in your hook is, you are rug hooking. You are pulling something up through the backing and you are rug hooking. It is as simple as that. 
There are other videos I have listed and many people have listed about more detailed things, little tricks, little effects, things to add, how to finish your piece, how to care for your piece. All of that stuff comes later. But this video was just about what is rug hooking? What does it look like? How does it work? What do I need? So I hope I've answered those simple questions. This is a really, really fun craft. This is a craft you can go really neck deep in multimedia stuff. Uh, it's easy. It has one move and that's pulling a loop up. It's a, it's a one trick pony. And you realize as you go along, it goes faster and faster. It looks better and better. Although I have to say some people's first pieces are absolutely gorgeous and out of the park. It's a folk art and you need to remind yourself that people did this with a bent nail and strips of clothing that wasn't good anymore. People just sat by a fire and candlelight or, or firelight and pulled up loops with a bent nail. So don't get too bogged down with expensive supplies. Don't get too bogged down with perfection or evenness of loops. All of these things are styles that come and go. This is a folk craft. And if you are pulling up loops and you see that what is evolving on the surface of your work is something colorful and pretty and folky and yours, then you are definitely succeeding. There is nothing else. You'll just go from project to project in the future and learn new things on the way if you want to. But it is a fun craft. I would recommend it to anybody. If you have any questions, you can write to me at ribboncandyhooking at gmail.com. Again, I'm Deanna. I do a live show about rug hooking, a lot about the history of rug hooking, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, 1130 Eastern Standard Time on this channel, Ribbon Candy Hooking. On Wednesdays, we get together for a Zoom call and we chat and look at what each other's working on and are just silly and talk about crazy stuff in person. And on Fridays, I do a cocktail hour where I do a much longer show and we play rug hooking bingo once a month. So there's a lot of fun things to dig into. Lots of videos waiting for you if you're just finding this channel. Good luck with your creative work wherever it takes you, but definitely give rug hooking a try. It's a lot of fun. Hope to see you soon on Ribbon Candy Hooking.